Hi, I'm Kat Kalashian, and this is the Live and Invest Overseas podcast. Today, we're here to talk about how to bring your pets overseas with you. Number one, I am a veteran pet importer. I have brought my cat, whom you see here, Pepe. He was born in the US, but I brought him with me to Panama. In Panama, I adopted my dog, Bella, as well, who you see there on the left. And um, <laughs> the two of them came from Panama with me to Paris. And you can see Pal Bella there disappearing through the turnstile. And there we are on the other side, all uh, together on Charlottesville Airport. And finally, happy in our new home. Pepe immediately got himself stuck behind a drawer. Um, Bella was freezing cold because she was born in Panama and had never experienced cold before. So we had to get her some sweaters. But uh that's just some background to let you know that I have actually done this for myself. I am speaking from experience and I have done a lot of research on the various uh, ways of doing this and the, the various possible ways to cut costs, but also the ways to make sure that you do it safely. So number one, to DIY or to outsource. So this is the first question. Do you want to do this yourself or do you want to hire someone to help you? If you hire a relocation service, there are plenty of them. Um, I know several people that have used companies, uh, mostly the one same company, and they've all been very happy with their experiences, but it's not cheap. It is certainly the easiest and also the most expensive solution there is for importing pets or exporting pets, as the case may be. You'll typically spend about $5,000 per animal, although there is a scale of economy. So if you are moving with multiple pets, then it will be a little bit cheaper than that per pet. Another thing that we'll get into, you'll realize it a little bit more as I, I go through all of these uh, ins and outs of this process is that if you've got more than one pet per person, so if you're a couple and you've got five cats, uh, it's going to be very difficult for you to deal with five cats um, between just two people as well as all your luggage. Because don't forget, you're not only moving pets, presumably you're also making a final move overseas. So you've also got your entire life with you in suitcases um, and you don't necessarily have the luggage to waste on a pet. So uh, if you've got more than one pet, logistically, um, it's going to be very difficult. But also, um, according to airline regulations, there's usually a restriction of one pet per person, sometimes two pets per pe per person, uh, depending on the airline, but that's more rare. So it, it might be your only option if you've got many animals. Option number two is driving. If you're only moving to Mexico, even Belize, Panama, Nicaragua, you might think that driving is a better option. It could be easier on your pet if your pet is used to driving and they're good in the car. This could be a much more stress-free option for both of you. Um, but it's risky for paperwork because many of the documents that you need have to be very specifically timed against your departure and arrival date. So one of the forms, for example, has to be completed within 10 days of departure, but no sooner than, I forget exactly, it might be a week, uh, it might be three days. So you have a very specific window in which to get this paperwork done. And if you're driving through Mexico and somehow, who knows, you have a flat tire, your car ends up in the shop. Uh, your paperwork will expire and then you'll have to figure out how to redo it all in Mexico before you can cross the next border south. Of course, if you're only going to Mexico, this is a very easy proposition. One of our editors, Lee Harrison, does this all the time with his dog. Um, his dog is very used to driving across the borders and Lee is very used to bringing him. So he's very, uh, you know, he's, he's got the, um, the paperwork down to a T and it's all very turnkey at this point. Um, but that's not the case for everyone. If this is your first time, it's not going to be that stress-free. And if you're driving across multiple borders, I would say put this idea out of your head right now because it's just too, too much of a risk factor to try and uh, get across however many borders you've got to get across within your time frame. Of course, though, it would be the cheapest option. <laughs> Number three is flying. And this is the category that probably the majority of people are going to fall into. It is by far the most stressful for you and your pets. <laughs> Make no bones about that. Um, there is a limitation, as I said, on the number of animals per traveler. And some breeds are just not permitted to fly at all. So a snub-nosed pug, for example, may not be allowed on an airline, on any airline, on any plane at all. They can count as carry-on luggage. So if you have an animal typically less than 15 pounds, they can come with you into the cabin, but they count as a carry-on piece. 
So this reduces your overall potential bag count, as I was explaining before. Um, you know, when you're making a move, you really need every single one of your pieces of luggage for the things that you really need after your move. So it can be uh, an imposition to give one of those bags up as a cat carrier or a dog carrier. This is, of course, the fastest option as well. Um, and it is expensive. You know, you will have to pay for your dog's airline ticket and there are fees that you're not going to get around no matter what. There are going to be fees. But if you do this yourself, it is far less expensive than hiring someone to do it for you. So where you might be paying $5,000 for one dog for a relocation company, it might cost you a thousand, say, to do it yourself. Before you do anything, you'll need to check your airline requirements and its limitations. So if you have a, if you're a frequent flyer on a certain airline, if you have a favorite airline that you like to use, go there first and check their pet reputation, their pet rules, their pet um, re restrictions, and just anecdotally how they are perceived as treating animals on board. United Airlines, for example, has a very poor reputation with, when it comes to animals. Um, so look all that up, see what you're comfortable with. If your airline, your preferred airline has more restrictions than another airline. So I, I took Air France, for example, I moved, uh, my dog and my cat via Air France. My cat was moved via United and he was just a carry on. When we came over to, uh, from Panama to Paris, they were both in cargo. Um, and I, uh, I, I definitely recommend, it, you know, Air France, I think, has a, a good reputation. I was very happy with their restrictions and their policies and everything that I learned about them when I did this research. So do put a bit of time into the due diligence because, you know, these are your fur babies. You know, you, you want to give them the best that you can give them. So if it means shelling out a little bit more or not having those frequent flyer miles racking up by uh, using a different airline that you might usually not use, I think it might be worth it in some cases. So some of the most common restrictions are obviously going to be weight, whether you're putting them in the cargo or in the cabin with you. The dimensions of the case um, are usually based on the weight of the animal, and the dimensions are going to dictate whether you can bring the animal into the cabin or if he's got to go into the cargo unit. The container specifications for both are going to change. So uh, look all those up. And these do change, uh, not frequently, but they do change. So you're going to want to look them up, you know, when you're actually ready to make a move. Don't rely on information you read five years ago and don't read it now and plan to do it 10 years from now. Um, as I said, snub-nosed breeds have a real limitation on flying, number of animals per person, also the seasons. This is something that might not have occurred to you. But if it's either too hot or too cold at the point of departure or of arrival, you won't be allowed to import an animal. So this actually happens to Lee Harrison, I mentioned already. He tried to export his dog from the United States, I think it was to Uruguay. And because of the differing seasons, because Uruguay is on the other side of the world, when it's summer there, it's winter up north. When it's winter down there, it's summer up north. Lee had maybe a few weeks a year, really less than a month, I think it was, um, where he could safely transport his animals. So the airline really wouldn't allow the dog on the airplane except for this one time of year. Something to look into. Also be aware of your departure and arrival times. Um, it's not a requisite everywhere, but sometimes you might need to actually meet with a veterinary authority or a customs authority when you arrive. And if that's the case, they might not work past certain hours. They might have just normal business hours. So if you arrive very early in the morning, very late at night or on their lunch break, you might not be able to enter the country until they open again. But check the country restrictions. So animal importation might be restricted altogether. Some islands don't allow importation of any pet of any kind at all. Um, aggressive breeds, as they're known, um, can be restricted overseas. Some countries just don't allow certain breeds in, period. France, um, for example, I own a Doberman, uh, and she does not have her ears clipped to be straight up. And apparently, I'm very lucky that we never did that to her because here in France, that's illegal. And you can't even import an animal with clipped ears like that So without at least special permits. Um, so I uh, would not have been allowed to import my dog if she had had those, um, that ear <laughs> situation. So look into even these little niche categories, you know, figure out really every little caveat that might prevent your pet from entering. There may be a quarantine imposed. There may be a home quarantine imposed, which is obviously preferable. It, it's most likely an option between the two. 
Um, but it also depends on the type of animal. So we'll get to that later. High rabies countries uh, in the United States and Canada, they're known as high rabies countries. In Europe, they're known as listed or unlisted countries. So if you are coming from what is thought of as a high rabies country, it is in Europe known as unlisted. Um, and that requires a lot more paperwork. But the animal requirements and restrictions, so age, is certainly one uh, dogs under a certain age cannot fly, period. Do dogs who are older and maybe have some health issues, their vet might recommend that they don't travel. You might be uncomfortable with them traveling. These are things to keep in mind. The rabies vaccine must have been given within six months, but no sooner than 30 days prior to travel. And that is only applicable to countries that are known as either listed or not a high rabies country. If it is a high rabies country or an unlisted country, as it's known in Europe, you'll be required to undergo a titer test, which is uh, basically just double checking that the rabies vaccine, vaccine was uh, effective. Um, it takes an additional three months to get that test done before you can travel. A micro trip, most countries are going to require it. It's the very typical one that your pet probably already has. Um, it's not always necessary, though. So if you're not already chipped, uh, you might want to look into it because you might not need to do it. Vaccines uh, for cats and dogs, all of the normal stuff that they would get annually applies. Um, but you also want to check that they've gotten all of their other, uh, you know, parasite checks done recently. So worms, ticks, uh, tapeworm, uh, everything like that. The paperwork is extensive. So you're going to start with the International Health Certificate. Um, it'll be filled out by your local health authority. So in the U.S., that's the USDA. In Canada, it's the CFIA. And it needs to be done within 10 days of departure. The certificate has to be endorsed by that health agency. Usually, this is about a $30 fee. And it takes 20 days round trip if you send it in my mail. If you're near enough to one of their departments, you can do it in person um, and that's much faster. That's what I did personally when I took my cat to Panama. But if you do it by mail, remember you need to put in a self-addressed envelope and save time or, you know, uh, make sure you factor in that time of getting it back. Paperwork goes on and on. The health certificate also has to be authenticated at the nearest consulate of your new home. So whether it's France or Italy or Panama or Mexico, uh, you need to go to that consulate then uh, and have it authenticated. Uh, may also need to be translated depending on the country. So uh, there are also differences in the, the way that these are authenticated between Canada and the U.S. So uh, if you're coming from the U.S., after you get it authenticated by the USDA, you must then also have it apostilled by the Secretary of State. But if you're in Canada, before you have it done at the consulate, you must have it legalized by the Global Affairs of Canada. Uh, so just make sure that you're always following these little tiny fine print lines and more paperwork. Um, there may be a home quarantine form. Panama has this. So I had to fill this out for my cat. I have not heard of it anywhere in Europe. So it might be something that you'll encounter elsewhere in Latin America. If you do have to fill out that form, then you'll authenticate it at the consulate along with the health certificate. Uh, you'll send it to the local pet authority, uh, sorry, the local airport pet authority. Um, and you may be also required to see a vet before you exit the airport and enter the country. This was also required of me in Panama. And again, this is where they had hours that I had to respect. I had to come in while they were during their hours. Um, luckily, I was able, my flight did come in after hours, but I was able to email them. Actually, it was a fax request <laughs> um, to ask if they would stay open late because our flight came in at 1130 and our dog, our cat rather would be on it. Um, and they were able to do that. I also had to pay a fee and exact cash is required, which I was lucky with. I didn't actually know that I had to pay an exact bills beforehand, but I uh, happened to have it. Getting ready to fly is the next step. So put something that smells like you in the crate with them, give them their favorite toy, uh, chew, something to chew on, something to eat, maybe a, a long lasting bone kind of thing to eat. Um, pack extra food. You'll, you'll be required to pack food with the animal because the, the flight uh, attendants will likely feed the animal for you. But make sure you give a little extra for before and after. It never hurts to give an animal a little bit of extra food on a, a special day like this. Um, favorite toys, as I said, uh, some treats, make sure you keep them in your carry-on so that you have them whenever you see your animal, you can slip a little treat through the cage. Um, and make sure to just tag your crate with your address all over it. There are a certain number of required addressing tags required all over the crate. 
I think I probably doubled that because what's the harm? <laughs> I would rather there be far too many of my address and name and phone number all over my dog's crate than to have somebody looking and get lazy and say, oh, well, I didn't find a number. Oh, well. And of course, don't forget all your paperwork. You might also want to have duplicates, even triplicates of all of this paperwork. When it comes to non-dogs and cats, and actually ferrets are also in this easy category, when it comes to every other animal, things get a lot more complicated. So birds are very difficult. There's a ton of paperwork and it usually takes over six months to complete it. Many birds are protected by the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora <laughs> um, Association. And uh, that means that there is even more paperwork to do. There's often a quarantine required for birds either before or after travel. And the rules vary significantly from country to country. So if you have a bird, um, you're going to have to do a lot more legwork to figure out how to import and also export. Exporting is actually the, the hard, the one of the harder parts and then the import is the next hard part. Invertebrates, fish, reptiles, amphibia, and mammals, that includes rodents and rabbits, these do not get rabies vaccinations, but because they're not able to get a rabies vax, they might be required to do other things. It's usually quarantine. It will probably also be some more paperwork or more permits, and they will also need that international health certificate. If your pet is a turtle or a parrot, really anything other than a dog, cat, or ferret, make sure that it is not prevented, uh, protected Sorry, under this CITES, CITES uh, organization. Um, because if, if it is, you'll need to apply for many extra permits. Um, over 180 countries respect these regulations, so there's really no getting around them, and you're going to need to do some legwork. If that's the case, you're going to want to work very closely with um, the country that you're moving to, and it may be worth the extra uh, expense of getting a relocation company to help you out. Finally, you've arrived. Um, you may, as I said, need to check in with the customs authority at the airport after arrival. This happened to me in Panama. I did need to meet them. In France, on the other hand, when I had two animals, I had my huge dossier of paper about this big for the two of them to be imported. We waited for them at the excess baggage area. We got them off. We, you know, put them on their trolley and started, started rolling them through customs. And I kept looking for people. I'm trying to shove my dossier of paperwork into everybody's face. And they were just getting annoyed with me because I was holding up the line of people trying to leave the airport. And they just rolled their eyes and waved me through and said, no, no, that's just go, just go get out. Um, so you may or may not be required to talk to people. Just, uh, I would, I would err on the side of caution and always try to talk to somebody, at least then <laughs> if you get stopped somewhere later along the way, you can say, well, it was that person who told me to just keep going. In Europe, you're going to need to arrive and apply for an EU pet passport, uh, which is, um, basically it's their medical, um, repository aside from being a way to, uh, let them travel easily throughout the Europe. It's also where all of their health history is, is kept. So it's a little database that you can carry around with you. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I never had this for my pets in the U.S. or in Panama, but I love having these passports where I know all of their important everything is kept. Um, so if you do that, uh, if you do come to Europe, you're going to have to do that within a few months. It's an easy process, but it is, you know, more paperwork and you've got to mail it away and wait and it's annoying. And finally, don't expect them to settle in right away. So, uh, my cat who is a long haired, we actually think he's partially Maine Coon. He's a rescue. So we don't know what he is, but he's a very, very big, very, very long haired cat. And he's, he's about twice the size of, of the average cat. So uh, good testimonial to him possibly being some part Maine Coon. Um, and when we moved him to Panama, we didn't really notice it because it was, it happened over time, but he turned into the biggest grunt. He absolutely hated life in Panama. And we realized this only after moving him to Paris, where we brought him and it was like, night and day. Like he had lost 10 years of his life. He was like a kitten again. He was so affectionate, purring constantly, always running up against you, licking you, just so happy. And we realized it was the heat. You know, we did have air conditioning, obviously, in Panama, but we didn't turn it on when we were out of the house for eight plus hours a day at work. Um, we would open all the windows and he would sit on the balcony if he wanted to. But we realized he just, he was miserable. He was so hot. He must have been dying <laughs> all day long. Um, so we moved him here. We actually moved in December and the winter to him, it was like seeing somebody who'd never seen the sun, you know, finally get some vitamin D on their face, but it was, you know, totally the opposite for him. He wanted no sun, no heat, 
no humidity. And so he now in Paris is loving life. He, he um, definitely turned a corner after being here. On the other hand, Bella, the Doberman, um, really did not like Paris at all when we first moved here. It was such an alien experience for her. She had never been in such a city where um, where everything is very much at street level. You know, in Panama, yeah, we would take her out to walk on the Cinta Costera, which is all grass. The cars, yes, it's a highway, but the cars are far away from you. You know, you're not you're not up next to them. Here in Paris on the street, she couldn't get used to the fact that cars would be maybe a foot away from her. The sound of the trash cans being empty, which if you've ever been to Paris is an apocalyptic sounding at times. The street cleaners, uh, delivery vans, uh, you know, trucks, um, tow trucks, and anything that was on the streets. I mean, she freaked out. Anything on wheels, you know, people on bikes, roller skates, roller blades, kids in strollers on their little push cart things. Um, anything that was on wheels on the sidewalk. I mean, she, it was as if she wanted to just roll up inside of herself. She didn't want to leave the house between the cold. I mean, also she was born in Panama. She had never felt the cold before. She was the opposite of Pepe. She got there and she was so cold. She didn't stop shivering for the first few months. We got there, as I said, in December and she was so cold. She couldn't stand it. She didn't ever want to leave. Um, also it was much darker. You know, she was used to living on the equator where there was 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of nightfall every, every single day of the year. When we moved here, there was just a few hours of daylight. So she couldn't figure out why it was always nighttime, why it was always freezing cold. How were there so many noises everywhere? All of these new dogs everywhere. Um, and she was not happy. Um, I would say it took her at least six months to become even bearable on the street. Um, I mean, it was torture to take her out. She didn't want to leave. We had to practically haul her out the door just to get her to pee before we went to bed. And I would say about a year in, she really totally had adjusted, was very happy. Now these days, she loves life here. I would say she's even happier here than she was in Panama. She loves our nice wide sidewalk. Um, she's no longer afraid of any cars, no longer afraid of anything on, on wheels. Uh, she's got a much higher tolerance for sounds and, um, and she doesn't, she, she's just much more, um, in tune with us. You know, she, it seemed like she lost her mind. Like you weren't even able to communicate with her or to, to connect with her. And there's those first few months, she was just absolutely overstimulated is really, I think the only way to describe it. We actually started giving her natural supplements to ease her stress for those few months um, nowadays we can let her off the leash. She trots along beside us. Uh, we, we throw a stick for her in the middle of the city. Um, not near lots of traffic, obviously, but she is absolutely adapted now and loves it here. Um, so don't, don't panic when your pet isn't having the best time when they first arrive. Just realize that it's as much of a cultural, uh, shock as much of a culture shock for them as it is for you and please subscribe to get any one of these videos in your uh, youtube library every saturday uh i have been kat kalashian and happy trails